something right about that, that, a perfect fourth and fifth, an octave, but something kosher here. There's a difference, and that difference is already detected by six months of age without there being any musical instruction. That the temporal order of sound in music is more regulated, and this child recognizes it more readily than if it is syncopated. And the same right left ear advantage for language and music that we have as adults is present in six months old. And this diagram just shows on the left a perfect fourth, on the right the perfect fifth, and in the middle the tritone that doesn't make any musical sense. I want you now to think in your mind of a song. It could be Happy Birthday, it could be White Christmas. Think of a song that you know. Then look at this slide. This slide shows you what your brain is doing as you recreate in your mind a musical tune. And it's on the right side of the brain. We're looking at the top is the front part of the brain, bottom the bottom, left is left, right is right. And in the right side of the nervous system, in the front, in the temporal lobe, on the inside part of the brain, all three areas are being activated when you imagine a tune. Now there are some people who say they can't recognize melodies. They're telling the truth. They may not be very frequent, but tone deafness does occur. In science, they're referred to as congenital amusics. These bar graphs show that between them and the general population to environmental sounds, like traffic sounds, or lyrics, as someone is doing lyrics to a song as words, they are no different. But when exposed to tunes, they cannot discriminate tunes anywhere near what the general population does. It is the way they are wired. It is a trait that they are born with. Ramon y Cajal was a distinguished Spanish neuroanatomist. And he speculated in the early 20th century that the brain would change as the musician was mastering an instrument. And here he gives the example of a pianist. And he was so right. And now in the 21st century, we know that he is right. The slide on the left shows in the upper portion the nervous system of a, the general population. Below that, right and left, marked male and female, are trained musicians who intensive musical training began before the age of seven years. And what is different is that highlighted area represents a cross bridge between the two sides of the brain called the corpus callosum, and it is thicker in people who are trained in music before the age of seven. In the diagram on the right, the surface of the temporal lobe by our ear is being demonstrated. And for the musicians, the left temporal lobe especially is larger in these trained musicians than in the general population. Music changes the brain. And here, remember we talked about the organization of the uh, musical uh, staff, and here it is larger in that left temporal area among musicians versus those of us in the general population. Some people are drawn to a specific instrument, and some of the instrumentalists and vocalists that we hear tonight, they may have been pre-programmed to have a predilection to the instrument they selected. People who are so-called fundamental pitch listeners are drawn to drums, guitar, piano, trumpet, or flute. And those that are spectral pitch listeners bassoon, saxophone, French horn, cello, voice. And Dr. Hong is going to show us how voice and a stringed instrument, violin, can be combined in the same musical gifted individual. And there is a difference on which side of the brain these tunes, these tones, are represented. What happens when a function that would normally be in the nervous system is lost or doesn't occur? These are examples of two famous individuals, Ray, Ray Charles, little Stevie Wonder, and Art Tatum is another one we could use from jazz music. Blind either early in life or at birth. The brain then expands the region for the representation for audition, sound, and potentially for music. In addition, 
in those accidents of nature in which an individual's nervous system is from birth quite different. Here, Rex Lewis Clack, the cover of the book his mother wrote about him, born blind at birth, has many developmental learning issues, but is a genius at the piano keyboard. On the right, Derek Paravicini in England, who was born three months early, one and a half pounds at birth weight, cannot give you his age or the date, but can play anything, anything on the music, on the, on the piano. We have on DVD, for your interest, if you're interested in inter intermission or at the end of the program, that 15 minute segment from 60 minutes about this gifted, unusual young man who can play anything he has ever heard. These are just images that show the brain of the musician is different than those of us who are not. The top row, all that red stuff shows the activity of the non-musician trying to deal with the sequencing of musical sounds. The trained musician doesn't need to use as much of his brain. It's far more efficient. Same is true when they are doing melodic discrimination. Non-musicians versus musicians. Much more efficient in the musician's brain. Or here, a spectral temporal processing kind of task. And all of it done on the left for the trained musician, right and left in the non-musician. We give a trained musician the task. Distinguish if there are errors in harmony, melody, rhythm. In all three, the arrow points to a region of the brain that is active. But in all three, the rest of the brain has a different response. So different parts of our brains are going to be activated as we listen to our colleagues perform this evening. And this just shows that in the non-musician, you're more apt to have one side, the right side of the brain active, whereas the musician will be active on both. Now, does it make a difference when we're listening to a pianist and he does a chromatic as opposed to doing a tune? The same words are different so far as the brain is concerned. Here we've got a pianist, he's in a PET scanner. He's got a keyboard before him. And what we're going to see is his brain reacting to these three states. Bach only in red. The uh, scales only in blue. But both are activated in the areas you see in white. So some overlap and some distinctive differences. Finally, as an example in music, using what's called transcranial magnetic recording devices, when a musician is practicing his or her art, the brain is changing. And in the area that's being rehearsed, that area expands, physically is larger. And the top row is what's happening as a pianist is memorizing, practicing his or her skill at the keyboard. What is below? is the same activity, but no keyboard. And it was said that both Horowitz and Rubinstein would practice, or as Horowitz would say, rehearse only, in their mind, the whole keyboard. And musicians can expand or change the organization of their brain in their mind. We'll skip this one and just conclude here. There are these theories you hear about baby Mozart there's not a lot yet learned about the true benefit of musical instruction early in life. We know it changes the organization of the brain. But this is the cover of a book by a man whose babysitter when he was a child was Nancy Reagan because his father was in surgical training in Chicago under Nancy's father. But Peter Perret, who is now a neuroscientist as well as emeritus music director for the Winston-Salem Symphony, showed along with colleagues at, Winston, at the uh, Bowman Gray Medical Center that musical training changed over an eight week span of musical instruction, a skill that is essential to learning to read. When we deprive our children of exposure to musical training, we do them a disservice. Now let me conclude by thanking our colleagues here at Steinway 
This was taken with Kyle Pagano, who truly is a genius and professor of piano at Arizona State University, and one of the events that was held here by Steinway. Thank you very much, and Janet, thank you for all that you have done to make this evening possible. Enjoy the night.